Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. Sorry we're starting a few minutes late. That's my bad. Um, but I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I am very delighted to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on gerrymandering. And um, today we're examining the state of North Carolina as a case study because it is really the home to the most egregious gerrymandering. So we're joined today by North Carolina House of Representatives, Representative Pricey Harrison, Somia from the National Redistricting Action Fund, and Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and our moderator today is North Carolinian Shaniqua McClendon. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones and please don't do video recording and photography. We are videotaping this program and it will be available on the Hammer website so you can share it with family and friends. Um, I also want to mention a few upcoming Hammer programs you might be interested in. On March 19th, we're doing a Hammer Forum on the growing YIMBY movement. That's sort of um, pro-development, neighborhood, grassroots organizations. Uh, opposing the NIMBY movements. Um, we're also planning programs for the spring on the Mueller investigation, progressive border policy, what would it look like, and also um, what is going on in Virginia. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know what the behind the scenes names are. Um, okay, but now on to today's program. I'm going to introduce our guest speakers and then we'll get started. Representative Pricey Harrison is in her eighth term representing the citizens of Guilford County in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Her terms have been defined by her championing of issues related to the environment, clean energy, elections, consumer protection, social justice, and more. She's past co-chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Nat Natural and Economic Resources and served as co-chair of the Environmental Re Review Commission and the Committee on the Environment and Natural Resources. In addition, she serves or has served on House Energy and Energy Efficiency, Judiciary, Election Law and Ethics, Redistricting, Public Utilities, Regulatory Reform, Alcoholic Beverages, and Marine Resources Committees. In 2014, she received the Friends of Disclosure Award from the North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections and was elected president of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. She's a native of Greensboro and graduated from Duke University and U University of North Carolina Law School. Somia Noranchania has a, over a decade of experience focusing on campaign organizing and strategic planning. He's currently the campaign director of All on the Line, which is a campaign of the National Redistricting Action Fund, and he leads the National Democratic Redistricting Committee's advocacy, outreach, and 2020 census efforts. He most recently served as the national political director at Organizing for Action. He's also served as the national field director at Enroll America, and as an assistant director in President Obama's White House, in addition to working on both the 2008 and 2012 campaigns for Obama. Somia lives and works in Washington, D.C. Latasha Brown is the co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund and the Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute. Her goal is to ensure that all human beings have access to quality education, safety, security, peace, love, and happiness. She's been featured on CNN, HBO, MSNBC, and Fox, and also serves as the founder of Saving Ourselves Com Coalition, a community-led disaster relief organization that helped hundreds of families in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Currently, she serves on the board of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, the Southern Documentary Fund, the U.S. Home Human Rights Network, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. Our moderator, Shaniqua, Shaniqua McClendon, is the political director for Crooked Media, home to the popular podcast, Pod Save America. At Crooked Media, she led the creation of their midterm voter engagement program, Vote Save America. She's a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where she earned her master's in public policy. During her studies, she also worked at Facebook on their politics and government outreach team. Prior to graduate school, McClendon served in various capacities on Capitol Hill, starting off as an intern in the Obama administration, and then she was a staff assistant for Senator Kay Hagan, and went on to serve as legislative direction director for Congresswoman Alma S. Adams. So today we're going to get a brief explanation of gerrymandering from Shaniqua McClendon, just so that everybody in the room is up to speed and on the same page. And then she'll moderate a roundtable discussion with Representative Harrison, Somia Naranchania, and Latasha Brown. So please join me in welcoming Shaniqua McClendon. Um, so, 
<clears throat> Here we have a picture of what used to be North Carolina's 12th district. Um, as you can see, it is oddly shaped. It stretches pretty far from the um, southern part of the state, pretty close to the northern border of the state. I actually used to work for the congresswoman who uh, currently, well, she represented it before, but now the, it's been redistricted and has a more appropriate shape. But during that time, um, I can certainly attest to how difficult it was for her to meet the needs of people in such different parts of the state, and even us trying to get her to the different, or sorry, district, even trying to get set up her travel to get to different parts of the district was difficult. Um, and there was a joke, I'm pretty sure this was just a general joke that other people used as well, but she would always say, you could open your car door in some parts of the district and the car door would be in, in a different district. <laughs> um, and so we can, um, and so before we get started, we're just gonna um, watch a quick video that does a pretty good job explaining what gerrymandering and redistricting is. Then I'll offer a few more points and then we'll get started on the, um, on the discussion. Okay, so one thing that was touched on in the video that um, the gentleman did not dive more into is where we get the census and, and redistricting in, in the Constitution. And so that is in Article 1, Section 2. Um, it's a lot longer than this, but I pulled out <coughs> two pieces er, about this, and I'll just read them really quickly. The House of Representatives shall be com composed of members chosen every second year by the people of, of the several states. Um, and then it goes on to list states, only the ones that existed at the time, according to their respective numbers. Um, and then the second piece of that, um, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of, of 10 years. It's, so that's why we have our census. I can go to the next slide. And so why are we talking about North Carolina today? North Carolina, um, and we'll talk about this more during um, the the panel, but uh, prior to 2010, North Carolina had six Republicans and seven Democrats represented in the House of Representatives. And as you can see, that's pretty close to the, you know, it's about 50-50, Republicans had 54% of the vote share. After redistricting took place uh, in 2011, this is what it looked like. You had nine Republicans and four Democrats, even though Republicans had 49% of the vote share. And if we go to the next slide. Um, and in 2014, and it's still the case now, Republicans actually hold 10 of 13 um, districts in North Carolina. And as you can see in our most recent election, in the midterms that just passed, Republicans still got about 50% of the vote, but represent you know, 76% of, of the seats in Congress. So that just displays the imbalance that was talked about during the video and, and what can happen there. And now I'm going to invite our panelists up so we can get our discussion started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I like bothered all of them to be here, so I'm really appreciative. Um, so before we actually jump into gerrymandering um, and redistricting, I wanted to, um, and I spoke with Representative um, Harrison about this when I was chatting with her for my, um, my thesis uh, project last year, but um, could you talk about North Carolina's history with voting in general <laughs> and access to the ballot and how it could go from having actual pro-voter policies in place to what a lot of people know it for now? Um, and thanks for having me, and I appreciate the crowd here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, I, um, so I would describe our um, voting history as pretty fraught up until the Voting Rights Act. I was doing some history review and saw some very horrifically uh, racist statements by previous governors, and the end, we had that good, the only coup in the United States happened in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 to throw out all the uh, duly elected African Americans. So we actually had a pretty fraught history, but after the Voting Rights Act in um, 1965, four, five, five, um, we, we had been fairly enlightened and had some, um, some of the most progressive voting access in the country, including same-day voter registration and um, expanded early hours and 
automatic uh, automatic uh, registration for 16 and 17 year olds and out of precinct ballots um, just a lot a lot of um, a lot of access to the ballot for folks, and we also had some pretty good public financing, and uh, that's something that's really important. It's not part of this discussion, but the campaign finance aspect of elections can't be um, overlooked, and so we had all these wonderful policies, and I, after we had the, um, the ju judicial public financing, nonpartisan elections, and uh, after the uh, 2010 election, which was a, a wave election for a lot of us, and then the, um, the 2012 Republicans, and pardon me for sounding a little bit partisan, it's not meant to be, but when the Republicans discovered in 2012, they undid a lot of that because I think they felt like they weren't winning on the message, so they were gonna win by restricting access to the ballot. So then that's when we had the monster voter ID bill that was challenged and the Fourth Circuit described as uh, targeting African-American voters with surgical precisions, precision and then, um, the, and made us the first state since 1921 to have partisan judicial elections. And, and then they started this um, gerrymandering that you saw at the congressional level, but also at the state legislative level. Thank you. Um, and one more question before we specifically talk about um, gerrymandering in North Carolina. There's always a lot of conversation around it, and I think a lot of people think that the ultimate aim of it is to, and this is part of it, but to draw a district that you can, you know, just sit in and win and keep winning. Um, but often we don't talk about the fact that a lot of, so for instance, if a Republican legislature is doing this, a lot of Democrats are actually packed into pretty solidly blue districts, and then the other ones are a little diluted, but just enough so that um, the other party can still win. Um, can you talk about how that hurts voters? Like who's being disenfranchised when these decisions are being made, um, and, and who ultimately like suffers the consequences of those decisions? Well, ultimately, how, how are you all doing? I'm so happy to see you all here, but you know, I'm from the deep south, so we like spirit, and I'm from the, I'm from the Southern Baptist Church, so we like a little noise in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on. And hold on, hold on. Have y'all heard that before? So as I get ready to answer the question, I wanted to raise that because today is also the commemoration. Um, while I live in Atlanta, I do work in North Carolina, I'm a native of a little city some of y'all may have heard of called Selma, Alabama. And today um, is actually the 54th commemoration of the Selma to Montgomery March, which is actually um, the Voting Rights Act. It was the Voting Rights Movement as a result of the Voting Rights Movement that was centered and anchored um, in Selma, the Voting Rights Act passed. So what we're talking about, even when we're looking at, at, at gerrymandering and the, um, the issues that are happening, um, there is a structural racism component that has always been um, has always been the driver around racial, around gerrymandering. Um, and, and oftentimes we have to look at this in two ways. We have to look at this from a partisan perspective. And so oftentimes we talk about it from the partisan perspective because there are two parties that basically kind of control the process of how the districts are drawn. Um, and there's, you know, the, you've got a Republican district or Democratic district. And as you see in North Carolina, while they don't have, they don't have the majority of the vote share of the 13 districts, uh, representative seats, they have 10 of the 13, right? Because of how the district is drawn. But I also think that it's really important to note that the Democratic party in many ways has been complicit as part of the process as well. And so what winds up happening, you see districts that people want super safe districts. And there's this compacting um, of black candidates, um, even with black electeds really supporting that, right? And so what winds up happening, you have a smaller representation Right, because you've got these compacted districts that both the Republicans and, in some ways, um, the Democratic Democrats have actually been complicit in supporting. So I think it's really important when we're having this conversation that we're having it in a context of recognizing that this is really about power, and this is about. That's why I think it's really important that it, that the political parties, where there's a process um, for political parties 
to gerrymander the district, to draw these districts, it is critical that communities and NGOs and organizations are part of that process to make sure that there's integrity, that the communities are represented. And so in what we saw, what we see um, traditionally um, and what we see in North Carolina is that you can look at the districts, right? And see, we, when we were doing work um, in North Carolina, I'm a co-founder of an organization called Black Voters Matter Fund. And we work with several, we work with, with many organizations in, um, in North Carolina, two that I'll give a shout out to, um, um, Blueprint North Carolina and Advanced North Carolina, two of the organizations we work with, the NAACP and the Poor People's Campaign. Um, it is important that communities are actually informed and educated on how critical the redistricting is, because even with the census, it is actually an economic issue. It determines where resources are spent, right? It determines uh, it determines policy and representation. And so that and so when we look at the when we look at the maps, I think it's important to overlay that there's this there's a partisan component to it, but there's also a racial. Um, component, a racial equity component um, to it that we really have to have as part of the conversation. Um, and it's important that we're, um, it's, I'm glad that you all are here, but it's really important that the public is more educated around how critical um, the drawing of those districts, how critical the census is, and why we have to make sure that we're holding both parties accountable, that there's fair and equal representation. Oh, hey, so, uh, and that, that's great. And just to add specifically what's happened to North Carolina since, um, since the uh, takeover, or the, um, the 2012 election is, we were pretty much, I would describe this as kind of an enlightened um, state in the Southeast, which I know isn't saying a lot, but um, <laughs> it's, it's something. And um, so, you know, after they took over, we all of a sudden uh, were having guns and bars and restaurants that serve alcohol and on school campuses. We're uh, uh, repealing a lot of our important protections for women's reproductive rights. Um, we had, I, I had to write down a list because there was so much of them. They were reenacting tax cuts for the wealthy. We're engaged in all kinds of environmental rollbacks. We um, cut public education and st steered money to charter and, and uh, private schools and with vouchers that are, don't have to um, practice um, anti-discrimination. We had um, this, uh, we had House Bill 2, the bathroom bill. We had um, one of two states with the Racial Justice Act that recognized that we had racial, um, racial bias in our court cases. And if you did, you could, get a, you could have your death sentence commuted. That was, that was um, repealed. And the gay marriage amendment, amendment, the gay marriage ban amendment. Those are just some of the things that happened since 2012 after the Republicans took over. And it was just, a, that just this litany of anti-people um, policies. And that, I guess that's just sort of the actual practical impact of having um, gerrymandered districts that don't reflect the electorate. And just to, like, step back a little bit, I think <laughs> the main thrust of the answer to this question is voters. Voters are the ones who end up suffering under gerrymandered districts because it is a process in which politicians are picking their voters instead of voters picking their politicians, picking their representatives. And so what you end up having is the one person, one vote mantra isn't necessarily true when you gerrymander a district because you will have certain districts where that the one person's vote doesn't really matter as much as in another more competitive district. And that is the purpose of what a gerrymandered district is doing. So when you don't have the voter's voice being heard, that's when you get these policies. And that's when you get to places where, you know, you want the, the majority of voters in North Carolina want Medicaid expanded, but Medicaid isn't being expanded because the voter's voice doesn't necessarily get heard at the ballot box. So when we talk about who's actually suffering here, it's the folks who aren't in power. It's the voters who should be part of that representative democracy but are being cut out of it through the process of gerrymandering. Okay. And so we can kind of stick with... Um, the, the policies and the, uh, the practical impacts of what happens when gerrymandering happens. Um, and you're in the legislature um, in North Carolina. Could you just speak a little bit to what those fights look like? Do Democrats, or I should say, should the party, the minority party, does the minority party ever in these instances, do they have anything that they can do? And I would love for you all to chime in on this as well, but just specifically thinking about the fact that what redistricting looked like in North Carolina were super majorities in the legislature. And, you know, is there any recourse? And one more layer, um, 
2016, voters elected a Democratic governor in North Carolina. Did that have an impact, or did redistricting still have too much of an impact to, for that to change? Right, so um, it's it's been a really con complicated history on, on redistricting in North Carolina, and it's been going on for a long time. Um, Yes, we, we actually we had a Democratic governor in 2011-12 as well when the Republicans took over, but at that point they didn't have the supermajority. But they did have the supermajority um, after the 2012 <laughs> redistricting. And so that just meant that they could override every governor, uh, the governor's vetoes. And what, what has helped, with because North Carolina's a purple state and uh, we like to consider ourselves you know, somewhat enlightened, um, it's, it's really been really hard to fight back against some of these really dramatically uh, backwards, extreme, overreach policies. And, um, and mostly we've had to resort to the courts, and that's where we've been stopping a lot of these really bad unconstitutional laws. And that's actually been a big help to us. But uh, as a reaction to that, then the Republicans thought, well, we need to redistrict the judges, and we need to take the – the ability of, of the governors uh, to appoint vac judicial vacancies, we need to take that away from them. I mean, they, when they, so they, they were passing these laws, these laws were getting challenged in the courts and getting declared unconstitutional, and so then they wanted to re refigure the judicial system, which is just really, they, their humility knows no bounds, and um, shameful. And what, and I, I've been talking to Shaniqua about this, um, most recently what's happened is, um, the, uh, some uh, lawyers have challenged the very legitimacy of the North Carolina legislature because we were declared by the Supreme Court to be Ill illegally gerrymandered and Ill <coughs> consequently illegally constituted as of, of June of 2017. There's some constitutional scholars who feel like anything that the North Carolina legislature has passed, at least since June of 2017, is actually not legitimate. So there was a court ruling uh, 10 days ago by a judge that said that the constitutional amendments that were on the ballot, placed on the ballots by the Republicans to take away more power from the governor and to put into our Constitution a voter ID and a tax cap. Um, they, the judge threw them out and said that they were, um, because our legislature was Ill illegally constitutionally racially gerrymandered, we were not um, able to put those on the ballot for the people. So I, I think that's, uh, that's one way to fight back is through the courts. And fortunately, the courts are still um, elected fairly in North Carolina because the efforts to um, reconfigure um, the court system by the Republicans failed. I think another way to, to quote unquote fight back is through the public uh, and having people talk about why this issue matters to them. Uh, and you know, gerrymandering is a bit of a wonky subject. It's a, it's a little bit you know, inside the beltway. I think it's picking up steam uh, generally, but when you connect what gerrymandering does to the everyday lives of Americans, to the everyday lives of North Carolinians, to the bathroom bill, to the lack of health care, uh, to uh, enshrining a tax or enshrining voter ID, I think people tend to care more and more about it. And so connecting that issue with how it affects them day to day, uh, public accountability, I, I know it, it seems really hard that public accountability uh, can and should work, but it does. And, you know, not to stray too far away from North Carolina, but Idaho just, they have a 3-3 three, three independent commission, uh, and the minority, uh, the majority party there tried to make that into a 4-3 commission recently through legislation, and through public outcry and media outcry, they, pu they had to pull their bill. Uh, and there was, without that, it probably could have sailed. Right, and so public pressure is another way to really fight back and to say, we are paying attention in 2020 and 2021, and we cannot afford another decade of illegally gerrymandered districts or unfair maps because that means another decade of progress on all of these issues that affect me personally <laughs> not moving forward. And I think that's a, a really important point to make as well. And I think um, um, just ditto, ditto, ditto. I think I, I, I do think that we have to um, figure out how do we expand this conversation. This isn't about gerrymandering. This is really about democracy. At the core fundamental piece, this is really about democracy. Whether it's voter suppression, whether it's gerrymandering, it's all, it's, it's it's an attempt to marginalize the public so that an elite few can control and make decisions in the country, right? And to, and, and to um, garner wealth. 
I mean, I, I, and I, I think that as long as we come at those of us that are political operatives, you know, oftentimes we're in the space and in the box where we're talking about it in political terms, which is fine because that's kind of the work that we do. But as we're doing this work, we've got to really shift a couple of things. One, we've got to shift this idea that there's this, it's kind of big brother, that there's government and then there's the people. No. The government is supposed to be for the people, by the people, and of the people. And we've got to demand that. And we've got to create a government structure that is representative of people. Not look at it as the opposite as in some way we're going to ask this government. We're going to, how, how dare we? We've got to ask the government to do something to look out for the people. The government should only exist to the extent that it serves the people and that is a part of the actual public of the folks. It is, that's what the Constitution says. And we've got to demand whether it's in North Carolina, whether it's in California, we've got to demand that that is, that is respected, right? And I think in doing that, we have to look at these issues around gerrymandering to open up a space for people to really start thinking about what does governance mean, right? What does governance mean? Why is it even important that I care? Right, why is power, how is this connected to my day-to-day -day life? And part of doing that is having a public conversation, but organize. We've got to organize communities. We've got to have grassroots groups and communities that all along the process are part of the process. We're actually working with some groups and exploring now, how can folks, how can people, everyday people really start thinking about what are the maps that we want to see? What's the drawing we want to see? Not just ask the Democrat and Republican party Party, what do they see, but really be able to get ahead of the curve and think about in terms of where there's power. Because I do think that there's this issue of how we've seen the infrastructure for political power. We've either left it up to the political parties, whether it's Democrat or Republicans, or it's been about the candidates, right? And in either of those circumstances, both of those entities are, are literally organizing or creating a framework or even the maps to support the maintaining of their power. We've got to shift that. We've got to shift that paradigm and create infrastructure that is about people having power. What does that look like? What will a map look like that actually represents and empowers people, low income, um, rural communities, other people who are often left out and marginalized in this process? So I just say that as we're talking about, I'm so glad we're having this conversation, but I think it's really important that we look at it from a that we've got to do some popular education in our communities that we can actually demystify you know, some of these, the political terminology around this and get people to see how they're every, that the drawing of this map, because we know what maps are, right? That the drawing of this map has a particular kind of impact on my community and how do we get people engaged on being on the forefront of that process? Do you all feel like so specifically thinking about 2010 in North Carolina, where well, I had just moved to DC. I mean, I was like into politics, I worked on the Hill, but I didn't necessarily recognize what was coming with the census and that um, midterm election. I imagine a lot of other people did not, or it might not have resulted that way. As you all are engaging in the work that each of you do, are people more in tune or just aware of what redistricting even means, what the stakes are, and that they can actually have an impact on all the craziness that has been happening in North Carolina? Well, it's my sense that um, people are much more aware um, about how they're impacted by this, and there's been a much stronger sort of grassroots movement, at least in, um, in North Carolina, and um, I, think that, um, I think that folks are really engaged. The census piece of it that's critical is not as, um, on, on, the top of, on people's radars, but and that's a really important piece of it to make sure every every vote gets counted, and um, every person gets counted. I just um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, there's a lot more energy around it. It's less of a wonky term that people realize because we have this crazy gerrymandered uh, legislature in North Carolina that, that we're passing policies that just don't reflect uh, the values that we have in North Carolina. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think people generally are are much more aware about what redistricting means and why it matters in 2021, given what happened over the last decade. Uh, I would say uh, I'm not one of them. I didn't, I didn't pay particular attention in 2011, but there are a lot of community groups and a lot of folks who were on the ground in 2011 who you know, I should shout out and say they were working on this and they probably didn't get the support they needed. Uh, and I'm glad that we're able to be a part of it and, and work with them this coming round, but there were people on the ground, uh, but 
overall, uh, it's definitely m much more in the public consciousness and public mind this time around, but shout out to everybody who's been doing this work for a long, long time. I agree. I actually think what's happening in North Carolina is a result of people being more engaged. I think it's backlash. That ultimately, um, as North Carolina becomes this purple state, it became the state that, that people know that is, um, you could possibly, the state could turn possibly blue in a presidential election. You start seeing flood, uh, that state was flooded, I work in philanthropy as well, flooded with um, conservative dollars to um, for all kinds of campaigns from national. Normally it's kind of like a state piece, but there became a vested interest, I think, because as the state uh, becomes more progressive and as the state is now seen as a state in play in the South, right? And so I think what you see that's happened in New um, what you've seen is that there's backlash. And, and historically, this is, historically we've seen this, we've seen this in the South, but we've seen this around the country. Whenever there has been progress, particularly, I can speak to, um, <clears throat> particularly in terms of black voters, um, whenever there has been political progress, there's always a backlash. There's always been a white backlash. I can go to city after city, I can go from Selma, I can go throughout it. There's been policy backlash, there's been economic backlash, there's been political backlash. And I think what you see in North Carolina is not a result that North Carolina is, is moving backwards, but really more like what the representative is saying, the state is actually moving forward. There's a tremendous amount of potential um, in terms of thought potential and where um, uh, uh, North Carolina is in terms of the, the triangle, the kind of the, the technology, the, um, the world-class schools, there's a young population there. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of possibilities that exist in North Carolina. And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing um, this conservative side that wants us to go backwards. Um, to really focus on North Carolina because they see the the the, the light is on. I mean, it's on the the right is on the wall. It is the South is rising. It is becoming more progressive. Younger people. There's a broad base of coalition in terms of the fastest growing region in the country. And you're seeing uh, you're seeing people. You're seeing the diversity. You're seeing an increase in the diversity. You're seeing young folks. And I think as a result, places like North Carolina and other Southern states, you're going to see an increase. And then not to mention. I'll just raise this, not to mention that those of us that have been doing voter rights work, we kept saying we would see this kind of behavior if you strip Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So here it is, elections right after Section 5, almost we could, it, it's almost like we could have been um, fortune tellers. We could have told you that this would happen, so we are also seeing a result of what happens when they took the teeth out of the Section 5 and the preclearance clause out of the Voting Rights Act. So I'm going to shift just a little and kind of um, probably should have started with this question. Um, but could we just kind of expand a little bit on what happened in North Carolina after the 2010 election? Um, ACA made a lot of voters mad and they elected a lot of Republicans and then the maps were drawn and then a lot of fights happened in the courts. Could we walk through and um, any of you if you have insights on this, but the specific fight in the legislature and the way the maps were drawn, thinking about putting Democrats against each other in districts so that you know one of them has to go and a Republican will get whatever's left over. Um, and then if, just to shift into um, the court cases that followed that and kind of how we got to where we are now. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give an initial response and then, uh, so I, I was uh, one of, I think, um, five uh, women legislators that was double bunked. I mean, they, they seem to target a lot of the women legislators. We got double bunked, which means put in a same district as another woman, another female legislator. So, so we lost a lot of the women Democrats. I was actually put into a um, double bunked with a colleague and then put into a minority majority district to hopefully get rid of me in, in a primary. And um, that happened to a bunch of my colleagues. So it was, it was pretty deliberate the way the fellow who came and helped draw the maps in North Carolina was sort of notorious for, um, for doing this um, uh, targeting and the and one thing that can't be lost is the fact that the um, the difference between the kind of gerrymandering that had happened in the past and and now as the software has gotten so uh, sophisticated that you can really put in a lot of factors that you couldn't before so you can really drill down and, and draw these districts that are hardcore and that's how the Republicans have managed to draw the kinds of districts they have and so I, I it's just worth noting so out of the box we had a number of lawsuits and it's really difficult to keep track but I'll just give you a, like a broad overview and so I can like give 
pour in the details, but there were initial, initially there, was, there were lawsuits challenging the congressional and the state legislative districts in the state court. But at that point, the state Supreme Court was controlled by Republicans, so that they just took their time. I mean, they took forever, and then they continued to approve the maps. That got appealed, went to the Supreme Court, got remanded back down. So finally, in 2015, I think it was, the um, parties sued um, in federal court, and the three-judge panels immediately ruled the congressional maps and the state maps were illegal racial gerrymanders. And so that's... Um, that um, was required, so we got sent back down to the state to redraw the congressional maps, which is how we fixed Congressman Adams' district, and the, the first and the second, that crazy uh, salamander up, uh, I mean, not salamander, but the I-85 map, that, those two were uh, required to be redrawn by the courts, and that required most of the districts to get redrawn because you're having to reconfigure the state. That did happen for the state. Day for the Congre it's really hard to keep track. That did happen at the congressional level for the 2016 campaign, but they couldn't get it done in time to do the legislative districts, which were also illegally racially gerrymandered until the 2018 election. So we had new maps drawn then. But right now, um, we still have some outstanding lawsuits, two of which challenge based on partisan gerrymandering. And as you've been paying attention, you know there was the case in Wisconsin um, that was sent back by the Supreme Court. But we also had uh, cases in Maryland and North Carolina on congressional maps. And then there is a North Carolina case on the legislative maps, all based on First and Fourteenth Amendment challenges that partisan gerrymandering is illegal. And the North Carolina, uh, the North Carolina and Maryland cases are being argued on March 26th before the U.S. Supreme Court. And the state case on state partisan gerrymandering is going to start on, on in a trial in June of 2019. There was a lot of hope that when Anthony Kennedy was on the court that we actually might get something um, because he had ex previously expressed some interest in partisan gerrymandering but was looking at a way for a fix. And there's a sufficiency gap and some other terms that might be some theories, but now that he's gone, it's not, it's not clear to me that we're going to actually get a Supreme Court that's going to rule that partisan gerrymandering is illegal. I would have said differently before um, Justice Kennedy retired. There are other, actually, there are other gerrymandering lawsuits going on, but those are the essential ones, and it's super confusing, and we may have another map being drawn before the 2020 election because the congressional map is right now ruled by a federal court to be Ill illegally partisan gerrymandered, but that's been appealed. I don't know if that made any sense to you, but it's, it's been very difficult to keep track. There have been like seven lawsuits. I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. That was a very comprehensive <laughs> leg litigation update. I do want to raise an interesting lawsuit, so I guess people would be familiar with um, Mark Harris in North Carolina 9, where the Republican candidate knowingly had someone on his staff that was paid um, that committed voter fraud. Um, he actually sued, he actually, no, well not sued, he actually went to court to get seated in a seat that he knew that was voter fraud. I just imagine this. So here's a Republican <laughs> that goes to the court and asks the court to put him in the seat where it has been determined that his person, that his son, it gets better, y'all. It's like young and the restless, right? <laughs> you know, that his son actually told him prior to hiring this guy that was actually on his campaign, right, told him that's a bad actor, don't hire him. And he said he just wasn't paying attention to his son because he did take him seriously because he's just, you know. And his son is a political operative, right, by the way. Hired him anyway, no, paid him. They actually paid folks to get rid of ballots, absentee ballots. He actually, had, this isn't his first time. In 2016, he had these, some of these same accusations. So this is a known actor, right? And he had the audacity to go to the courts to ask the courts to seat him in a position, in a seat that he knew that an actor on his campaign had committed blatant voter fraud. Is North Carolina politics. A gerrymandered <laughs> seat, a very gerrymandered a seat. A very gerrymandered seat. Um, sorry, I kind of got thrown off. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start to kind of wrap up here soon, but we've talked a lot about um, North Carolina and Republicans. And I would love for you all to 
it, is it just North Carolina and is it just Republicans who are guilty of gerrymandering? Um, and if not, and Latasha, you kind of touched on this on holding everyone accountable. Um, where are some other places? Is North Carolina really the worst place that this is happening? Georgia, Louisiana, it's the, the, the worst places are the, in the South, although there are issues in some other states, particularly Midwest states as well. But there's a case now that um, there are cases, lawsuits, major lawsuits. Georgia, Georgia is horrible. Um, matter of fact, in, and particularly in some of the rural in South Georgia, it's interesting, when we were doing some work, we were doing out campaigning, we would go on a street, on one street, there were four different districts on one street. How they had like, almost like a pie and just cut out people um, that had the same interests, but so that they could actually create um, spaces where, where you would marginalize and minimize um, black voting power. You see the same thing, Louisiana has a horrible history of redistricting. Um, Alabama, I mean, just, you know, the South. We, <laughs> we got some challenges in the South. And as, as, as progressive as North Carolina is, North Carolina still has a huge gap in terms of wealth and opportunity between African Americans um, in that state. So we've got we've to really deal with some of the structural problems that, that live in the Confederate South that we've not dealt with. But when you look at gerrymandering, you look at lo um, right now, there are major lawsuits filed in uh, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina. I think that there's a lawsuit in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken, um, that has some promise, but, but some of the states that we've seen the worst and that I know has a history of gerrymandering um, are those states. Uh, it, also, it, it also depends on how you define, like, what is fairness, right? Which is a, a hard thing to think about. But we're, go we're going state by state, but I wanna step back again and like, if we're talking about overall fairness, we have to talk about apportionment, going back to the census. And so, uh, yes, North Carolina is among the worst in terms of what is gerrymandered, but looking, moving forward, you know, you could make an argument that because of the political situation, because of uh, potentially the way in which underrepresented communities are gonna feel about the addition of a citizenship question to the census, you basically have a very bad situation across the entire country. Yeah. Uh, and the way in which apportionment is gonna work, uh, you could make an argument like, it's gonna be bad everywhere there are like, multifamily uh, homes, uh, multilingual homes, uh, multi-status homes, homes where uh, not, there are not just immig like immigrant families uh, that people like are yelling about being undocumented, but just immigrant families generally who are here legally, who don't want to fill out the census question because it asks when and where they were naturalized. Uh, and so I, I, th I think it's important to focus on North Carolina and the problems that came up in 2011, but we also have to look f forward to the 2020 census and what's gonna happen in 2021 if apportionment it doesn't end up going the way it needs to go because of the way the census ends up going. So all of you do work in this space. It might not be, well, I guess for Somi it's directly related to this, um, but what work are you doing over the next two years to address and try to, to fix all the gerrymandering um, that is happening in North Carolina and everywhere else? And what can people in here do who live in California who, you know, yeah, California actually has independent yeah. yeah, so what can people who live in a state that I guess more states should aspire to be like do from here? Yeah, so for California, um, I, I think the biggest thing is probably the census and making sure the census goes really well. Uh, California potentially has a lot at stake if the census does not go well uh, as one of the as the largest state uh, in the union. Right, so that, that would be the first thing to, to definitely focus on. The other thing in California is you have an independent commission process that allows for public engagement. So going back to what uh, Latasha said about making sure that the people are involved in the process, I think June 10th is the date that applications open if you wanna be a part of that commission. Like actually taking part in your democracy and being, uh, you know, looking at public maps, creating public maps, Figuring out, uh, listening to your neighbors and being a part of the process as it moves forward is gonna be really important, not just in California, but across the country. Um, and that's why, you know, the campaign that we launched, just quick plug, uh, the All on the Line campaign is part of the 
C4 affiliate, the National Redistricting Action Fund, is a place for Californians to get involved. It's a place for Texans, Floridians, North Carolinians to get involved. Uh, we really want to make the public be a part of this process, whether that's being a part of an independent redistricting commission in California or Arizona, or going and talking to your state legislator and showing them this is what a fair map looks like for my community in Charlotte or in Raleigh, like that's gonna be really, really important over the course of the next two years. Uh, along with everything else uh, that Rep Harrison talked about, the, you know, continuing the litigation, continuing the court fights, making sure folks are able to show up at the polls and that they, it, it's a fair process at the polls. It, it's gonna be a multi-pronged effort and it's gonna take a lot of folks and that's why I'm really happy to see all of you here today uh, being, you know, coming on your Sunday e afternoon, evening, afternoon? I'm on East Coast time still. <laughs> Uh, Sunday afternoon to you know talk with all of us about gerrymandering. So I, there's a lot to do uh, in the next two years, and I I think there will be no shortage of work for folks to to help partake in. Um, I would say that you know it's it policy is one thing, and we we a lot of times we put focus on policy, but I like to I always like to remind people that Brown versus the Board of Education was 1954. Most schools were not desegregated until the early 70s. Right, so policy has limitations when you don't have public will. And so it's really important that we are doing this work to engage people in the process, but to also to build and educate and have and, and increase public will and shift the paradigm of how people see things. Because it's really interesting, you know, it's, I have a cousin who, 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 who lives in California and she would say often, she's like, oh, that's what you all do down there. Well, let me say why, why it's important to care about what happens in the South, right? You know, when when you looked at who was the attorney general, he was from Alabama. When you looked at who was the cabinet of Trump's cabinet, where did they come from, right? It is, and primarily because of elections and because of seniority, many of the most critical committees in Congress are actually led by people from the South. Your destiny, you can be as progressive as you want to in, in California, but your destiny, political, national destiny, is also impacted by what happens in the South. And so it's really important that we're thinking about what can we do, a couple of things. I'll say a couple of things. One, um, this last election cycle with the work that we were doing in the South is Rising, we had groups of folks, of volunteers in California that were actually doing phone banking for us. They were doing postcarding for us. They were working and strengthening organizations because they understood the connection of what happened in Georgia, how it impacts California, right? And so, so that's one way. Um, secondly, similar in along those lines that what you see in the south and particularly in these in and um I'm um, in these communities that are fighting voter suppression. Many of those organizations have been grossly underinvested. Many of the grassroots groups, this last election cycle, my organization was able to fund 120 organizations, black led grassroots groups. We moved about a million dollars. Most of the groups, 90% of the groups that we funded, had, had been doing this work with no resources, right? And so it is grossly underfunded. If there are ways to be able to contribute resources to grassroots credible groups that are doing work frontline on the to organize that's also another way that you can be engaged in the process and then third I think it's really important that we're lifting up you know this process around democracy that we're having a broader conversation that we don't get caught up in American exceptionalism that in some way we've all we've had this democracy the truth of the matter is we've never realized the fullness of democracy in this country we've never realized it and so we've got to demand it we've got to have conversations about it we've got to create the environment and such that what we're seeing in Washington right now that we send a strong message this next election cycle is that this government is for the people by the people and other people and that collectively as a country we've got to stand up and really push for progressive issues well wow, it's really hard to follow you <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone first <laughs> Of what they said, um, but specifically on the on the support for the grassroots groups, that's that's really critical. Um, North Carolina, we were hit by a horrible uh, hurricane Florence um, on September 13th, and that really impacted right. folks' ability to get to the polls. And it really helped having like Aaron Bird's group, the Blueprint, yes. working with the um, outreach in the grassroots to get folks to the polls. So keep in mind when you're watching those storms hover around the North Carolina coast every every year around election time, um, any support you can send. <laughs> Uh, moral or phone banking or coming to North Carolina and driving people to the polls is really helpful. 
I, um, that's, that's really important. And we've got this voter ID proposal that was put into our state's constitution because they, it kept getting overturned by the court. So they put it in the constitution thinking it'll, it'll um, be likely to stand up in the court. So that voter ID bill is, is not ideal. And it basically it says it allows for student IDs, but the universities that want to supply them have to go jump through a number of hurdles. So the, the ability, and you can't use a public assistance ID, it's sort of like you can use military passport, driver's license, the key ones, but you're going to have a whole lot of voters that are going to be dis disenfranchised. So we're continuing to fight that, hoping we can get that overturned. Um, I personally have been working for independent redistricting for um, about 10 years. I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm a Democrat who called for independent redistricting when the Democrats were in charge because what I saw wasn't, wasn't fair. So I'm continuing to push for that. And, um, and actually, I think I'm going to file a bill in the next couple of weeks that's modeled on y'all's uh, California Citizens Commission, I'm proud to say. So I'm <laughs> pretty excited about that. <laughs> I've been, uh, I've been working with Common Cause on that, and uh, we're going to get that filed. So I, there's tons y'all can do as engaged citizenry, and um, we just really appreciate your interest in being out here on a beautiful day. Thanks. And, uh, yeah. Let's give everyone a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yes, we will start taking questions now, but, yeah, if you want to share your contact information. So I would, um, um, you can, uh, our, my contact information is Black Voters Matter Fund. You can go online. It's Black Voters Matter Fund. Um, you can also find me on, um, the only way that I'm, uh, the only thing that I have in common with the president is I love Twitter. Um, right? <laughs> Is um, and you can find us on Twitter, Black Voters Matter MTR. I'm also very active on Twitter, and I always update about some of the things that's happening in the South. So you can find me at Miss M S Miss Latasha L A T O S H A Brown um, on um, uh, on Twitter, um, and also on the other social media uh, sites as well. And please visit us on Facebook and stay active. We really try to stay in actively engaged because we believe this has to be a national conversation because ultimately we're going to be the ones that make the change. Uh, I got a couple of plugs. So allonthelime.org uh, is where to find the campaign, uh, the grassroots campaign to get involved. You can also follow All on the Line on Twitter and on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, and then also our uh, affiliate is uh, democraticredistricting.com, uh, so you can also find us there. And uh, if you want to email us at the All on the Line campaign, you can email uh, allontheline at redistrictingaction.org. Well, as long as we're doing plugs, and I don't, I, so I, I would just like to lift up the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Yeah. They are the group that has been filing all these lawsuits and winning. And um, the founder just got elected to the North Carolina Supreme Court, which is really cool. And um, She's a black woman. I yeah. just want to say. <laughs> yeah, so if you... Uh, if you've got um, any inclination to go support an organization that's really making a difference in the South for, for civil rights, that's the group. Thanks. Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Hi. Is this on? Um, a couple of comments. First of all, the gentleman who was a... Uh, an operative in the 9th District in North Carolina for the Republicans prior, he'd been an operative for the, for the Democrats. Yeah. So it works both ways. The Democratic Party historically was the father and mother of the Ku Klux Klan. The point is, you're talking, you're talk do I get to talk here? Thank you. Oh, no, no. My question, you're, you're talking about getting people involved in changing, getting gerrymandering, gerrymandering corrected. Why does it always have to be, it seems as if it's geared towards only getting Democrats involved. Why not get the Republicans? Why can't we change the Republicans, which is, which is the father and mother of Lincoln? I am so glad you asked that question. I, I guess my answer to you is, why wasn't what I said valid? Because I started my comments saying that both the Republican and the Democratic Party have been complicit. And I'm just, I, I don't understand why you marginalize what I said. Because that's, I started in that space. I was very clear from the beginning 
saying that it was both the Republicans and the Democrats that have been complicit around this issue. And that's why it was important that communities, uh, did you all hear me say that? Yeah. Right, that it was important for communities. So I'll just say that, um, that I think you have, I, I understand your point. Um, I would appreciate that you would also acknowledge that all of us didn't say that because I specifically um, offered that because that and, and and also even gave a frame of why it was important that it was not inside of the party and partisan politics, but that why it was more more so important around independence. And as we're talking about in terms of of um, this operative, what I raised is what is happening now. I can respond to what is happening now. What I know now that is happening in the South is that in the South. What is happening right now is that the Republicans have been passing legislation. This is just the fact. It's not something I'm making up. If it would be the Democrats that were doing that, I would be here and I would be standing against that as well. But right now, currently, the Republicans have been passing legislation to marginalize um, black voters, and I'm speaking specifically of minority voters and black voters because that's where my expertise is, right? Um, to marginalize our vote, to be able to do um, to add voter ID and all these other efforts, but have been absolutely silent, have been absolute, this party that cares so much about voter fraud has been absolutely silent on what has happened in North Carolina. If you are an American and you love democracy, and you love democracy like we say we love democracy, why have they been silent? So I think we've got to call out and we've got to be courageous enough to really hold accountable and not get caught up in the context of what is partisan, Democrat or Republican. I'm standing here as an American. I'm standing here as a believer in democracy. And whether that is the Democratic Party or the Republican Party that is acting in a way that is marginalizing folks access to the ballot, we have to call that out. And in this case in Carolina, Republicans have been bad actors. And you, should, you shouldn't condone that either. You did it. Look, I've been on song banking and so you did for the last two years Great. to get Democrats elected. I don't need to be told about how to get Democrats elected, ma'am. You weren't. I, you weren't told. Okay, we have a question so, over here. I have a question? Question here? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Oh. Uh, the woman behind you is going to. So, really, yeah, really appreciate it. Like to ask us, somebody who does volunteer, in fact, with all online. 30 second elevator pitch to each of you. Could you like come up with a 30 second elevator pitch about why, t speaking to volunteers about why people should be willing to volunteer about why fa fair maps are important. So volunteer, expanded democracy, work our organization, we have a network all across the country. We worked in seven states this last election cycle. We'll be working in 11 states next election cycle. Black Voters Matter Fund is our C4. Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute is our C3. Our goal is to build infrastructure. So we would love for you to make phone calls, to be in conversation with us. Um, we do text messaging campaign. You know, we do a lot of work that we, it's really important that we think that the way that we're going to shift this country is that when, when we're all engaged and we're expanding the electorate. So taking it a, a little bit differently. So if the question is, what is the 30 second elevator pitch on why this issue is important and why to get involved in this issue? Uh, what, what I would say is, it, it goes back to my early answer is, if we want this democracy to work for the people, if we want it to work for the voters, then the voters have to be the ones picking their politicians and not the other way around. And truly what that means, be, because when politicians pick their voters, they are not accountable to what the public preferences are. When you think about how popular universal background checks are and how difficult of a road that has, or a state like Texas, a state like North Carolina, on expanding Medicaid and the fact that it has taken forever to get Medicaid expanded or not at all in some of these states. If, if you care about these issues, if you care about moving forward on things that generally the public cares about, then you have to care about how the maps are drawn because that's what at the end of the day is gonna make our democracy function is getting fair maps. And I, we didn't, I, 
Yeah, I, I, what he said, but also I, um, I, we didn't really talk about this much, but, and maybe it's just so obvious on the face of it. When you have a really gerrymandered legislature, you're only protecting your right, right flank or your left flank if you are um, in a safe district. So there is very little coming together on these issues that we all agree. And so you have a government that works for the people when people care about are in a competitive, are in a competitive race that they're going to have to protect respond to their constituents' interests. And I, um, it, it, I mean, I, it seems like it should be clear, but maybe people need to be reminded of that. I mean, you can just see what's going on in Washington right now. You're only worried about getting a primary challenge, and so then you just really don't feel like coming to the table. And so what's happened in North Carolina since the 2018 election is that after we've gotten out of the super majority, I mean, the super minority, we're actually working together, and it's just like such a different atmosphere, and we're um, bipartisanship, and we've got bipartisanship on our redistricting, sir, we've got bipartisanship on the redistricting efforts, and it's being led by a Republican, and that's really nice. And I, I did want to respond really quickly, too, because the, Republican, the Democrats were in charge of, of the government in North Carolina for a long, long time, a couple hundred years, and they were responsible for that horrible Wilmington um, coup and massacre and a lot of really bad stuff and a lot of really racist stuff and I um, sorry if I sounded like I was being partisan I was trying not to be we've got we've got a very fraught history and um, hopefully we are getting more enlightened but thank you this may be elementary but um, I was hoping to step back and get a little bit of clarification on how the census impacts the the drawings or impacts the districting overall. Is it more information that's used to help draw and create fair districts or is it something more that once the districts are created, we can look back to see if there's demographic representation or j just how is that census information used? And I'm also curious to get different thoughts. Um, I believe there was recently kind of an issue, I think it was in Conyers, Georgia, but if I'm not exact, it was a place that started with a C. And um, it was like one side of Conyers wanted to sp kind of split and have more minority run, a more minority run community, or it was, um, that the majority white population wanted to split and have their area represented by a white governance. And so I, I'm just curious what the thought is in terms of balancing um, that desire to, to have more minority or majority districts run I, I, just getting more thoughts on that balance and what happened specifically in that community. If you happen to know what that area was, I think it was Conyers. Was it this year? Because if it was this year, it's probably in Henry County. Uh, <clears throat> it's Around, an area called, it, it may have been, if it was this year, this past election cycle was Henry County. And what happened, there's a gated community. There's an affluent white gated community um, that actually wants to control. The, the, the demographics in that county have shifted. So now the demographics, while it was a majority white county, has now shifted and is a, a majority minority county. And so, um, so instead of there's a affluent white community that is a gated community that's kind of led this effort that was in the middle of the community, that it would be its own, um, it didn't want to pay taxes, it did not want to be governed, it wanted to have its own, maintain its own governance structure. So um, that's, that, if that's what you're talking about. I think it, it, maybe. Okay. I, I don't know about the second part of your question, but to the first part of your question on the census. So basically it, go, it goes back to how uh, apportionment works and what's in the constitution in terms of all persons being counted and the principle of one person, one vote. So the census counts all persons in the country at what, what is a pretty small level a census block level, and then they have to turn that file into the state for the state to then basically, the, the census will govern apportionment at the federal level and say based off of the number of people in the country, this is how many districts end up in California, this is how many districts at the House of Reps level end up in North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that population count 
ends up turning into how many districts each state gets. And then they get a file from the census that says, here's where all those people live. And then the redistricting process takes that file, puts it into now like pretty high tech mapping software and chops up the, the boundaries in order to make whatever criteria is in that state, it's, it's a state by state basis, whatever criteria that state governs its redistricting by, whether it's you know, contiguity or majority minority districts or what have you in order to then take that population of California and build the 53 districts out. So that's how the census ties in. It gives the initial data count of how many people are in a state and in an area so that when you draw the lines, you can make it as basically as equitable as possible or if depending on your motives as not equitable as possible. And, and also, in addition to the significance of redistricting, it's also significant for the states in terms of how much money they'll get for the federal government for, um, you know, health or education or the CBGD block grants and stuff. And that's why the citizenship question is such a problem, because it will undercount, it will undercount the populations in the states. Yeah. App apportionment is just one part of the census. The census literally determines hundreds of billions of dollars of federal funding and how roads and schools and infrastructure, all of that is funded for the next decade. It is pivotably important for our democracy that people fill out the census. Hi, I just want to ask a question about um, a, a kind of a third issue, We've covered gerrymandering and the, and the census issue, but um, when, when we look at like Georgia, the governor's race, um, obviously no gerrymandering because it was an at-large, right? And, and Florida senator and governor races at-large. So there, there the issue is voter suppression. And I'm wondering what your organizations or what your, your various activities are in, involved around turning that around, um, aside from, you know, trying to restore the Voting Rights Act, which, you know, is a big haul. Yeah, voter suppression has been, uh, um, it's just a problematic historic issue that has plagued this nation. Um, and what we saw in this last Georgia election, um, we saw where um, uh, districts, and it is, wasn't just Georgia, other states have the same problem. We've done a lot of work in terms of organizing, um, finding resources for community organizations that are on the front line of really fighting this issue. Also, real, there's a, um, an organization that Stacey Abrams has founded called Fair Fight. Um, where they're actually, she's really laser focusing on how to address voter suppression. I've been a part of lawsuits. We've sued, we've used the courts. The challenge is that, you know, what the, in, the, in our circuit, particularly in the Fifth Circuit, is a very conservative court, you know, and then when you don't have the protection of the voting rights, um, the fullness of the Voting Rights Act, and you have a, um, a very, uh, uh, um, even, even in the voter suppression, we saw nothing come out of the Department of Justice, right? We, didn't, we, did, we saw nothing come out of the Department of Justice, even though there was blatant examples of voter suppression happening. How did it happen? A couple of examples of things that happened. One of the polls that we went to, um, some, of, some of you may have seen this on television, but I, um, we had a bus that we were actually going around and engaging people to vote. We actually had 40 seniors 40 um, um, seniors in Jefferson County, Georgia, that we actually went to a community center. We had this pep rally, beautiful op opportunity. We were going down to vote. They wanted to ride with us to go to the polls to vote, which was probably about a couple of blocks down the road. And so as we were on the, um, this is in, a ru in rural Georgia, as they were on the bus, we were 40 seniors, we're leaving to go and the bus gets stopped. And the bus gets stopped by the director that said, someone said, had called the county commissioner's office and said they saw these black people getting on a bus. This is what was told to us, quote, um, getting on the bus and that the bus needed to stop right there and everybody need to get off the bus. And so I am, I am raised by my grandmother. And so I'm a, I'm a grand, I'm a grandparents baby. And so I know that, um, we didn't want the seniors to get upset. We didn't want, we, we didn't want to want them to get upset. And so we asked and they were like, well, you know, we'll deal with it later. And so they got off the bus. We even went later to find out that the county commissioner, the administrator of the county commissioner had made a call to the center who receives county commission funds to say that he didn't know us. We even went and met with him. This man said, I had vetted you all. You should have called me before you came to my county. And I, and, and that literally, I promise you, this is a, you can look it up. 
Um, and, and, that, and this isn't a place where this wasn't like a nursing home. This was active seniors. So this is one person that thought he had the right. And, and, and in addition to that, um, one of the women who we were working with happened to be the chair of the county party. This was not a partisan. We're not partisan. This was not a partisan activity. He said he made the call because she was attached to the Democratic Party that in some way he made a call to make a decision to stop a bus full of seniors from voting. And another incident with an organization that we had, we had a, a person who was actually going back and forth to the polls, taking people to the polls in a hearse. It was actually really interesting. And it was called the ride of your life, right? And, um, and he creatively would go and actually take people back and forth to the polls. Well, he got stopped and given a ticket by the state trooper. There were 11 cars of law enforcement that were stopped, because, that stopped, that were in the area when he got stopped because there's all of these tactics of intimidation, right, of voter intimidation. There are precincts that are put in police, uh, police precincts. We know the, the, the relationship that has been between the African-American community and, and police. You know, there's been all kind of efforts. One of the polls that we went to, they normally have 30, um, 30 machines. On this election day that was projected, there were 15 machines. People were standing in line, working folks were standing in line for three, four, five, six hours. We had folks that were knocked off in the last five years, Brian, 200 polling sites were shut down. So there is just compounded, there's a spectrum of how voter suppression looks and it's been compounded and compounded and that's why we really have to have this larger conversation about having a voter's bill of rights and really protect democracy. And we'll just, We'll take two more two more questions and then um, we'll wrap up. We have one on the side. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Ms. Brown, we we did hear what you said when you when you originally made your comment that was fair and bipartisan. Um, to that point, I I want to say that we we always in these panels, I think for the most part, try to make a concession to bipartisanship and for people of color we have a full understanding that the Democratic Party was not a friend of women or people of color for a very long time. And so we're, we have to look to see in the overall universal uh, feeling of us as Americans, look to the history and see which parties historically are trying to disempower the people, right. to your point earlier. Because if we look to do that, then we see who and why are trying to prevent people from voting. Another interesting piece of history, and, and thank you for mentioning Selma, I really appreciate it because it's very important. And I think I would love to hear the panelists um, after I finish this question also tell us where on this day of civic engagement and civic education, what uh, you are currently listening to in terms of podcasts or information that is excellent for all of us as American citizens to learn more about our history. Crooked Media did a wonderful podcast on the wilderness, which is an unpacking of the Democratic Party and how we got where we are right now. Um, that said, North Carolina is an interesting state because most aggrieved white male Trump voters have no idea that it was the last state to give white men universal male suffrage in this country. That it's just not about race, it's about class, it's about all of us as people getting our rights to participate in our government. 1856, North Carolina was the last state to give white men the right to vote in this country. 14 years later, on paper, black men got the right to vote, ironically, in 1870. Neither one had real power unless you had money and property. So if y'all just want to mention what you're listening to and uh, for the audience. I mean, it's not a good answer because that was, I mean, that was a great statement. I, I, because I do this day to day, I try not to listen to it. I'm like listening to NBA pods. I could give you some shout outs for that, but you know, uh, I got to have, it's important for self-care. That's, that's what I'll say. Self-care is important. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked about podcasts. So I do listen to 
Pod Save America. I also listen to um, the New York Times has one um, up in the minute. What is it called? The Daily. The, the Daily. I love it. I'm like, I can get, get me a little hot, a uh, little, little hit, and keep it moving. Um, there's also one that Bakari Sellers, who's from South Carolina, actually um, does it. I think it's uh, pretty good. And then I'm actually launching one um, called Love and Power. It will be launched next month. Um, love and power, because those are the two dual pieces that I think principles that are going to change the world. So, and, and I'll just add, in addition to Pod Save America, which I love, and um, and the Daily, and I'm I'm kind of a political wonk, and so I, I like Gabfest and and Vox and um, stuff that it's a little bit more politically oriented. And I just wanted to say I appreciate your comments. I was reading through the history of North Carolina and the way they treated voters of, of both colors, but particularly voters of color, and it's. Uh, it's sort of horrifying to think about what, what we've done. So we got a long way to go, but we're trying. I like the history chicks, too. I, 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 they're corny, but I love them. So the history chicks. And the last question. Should I go? Hi. Um, this is just another question about the census. I think when we were talking about California specifically, one of you said that the biggest concern was the census not going right. How could that happen? Is it just like people not filling it out, or what's like, the concern. Yeah, the, the concern is that given the addition of a question uh, to the census, the question is the citizenship question, which asks whether or not uh, a person is a citizen of the US and then if they were naturalized and when they were naturalized, given the addition of that question, that the actual turnout for the census will decrease more than it already has. So there are historically undercounted communities. Uh, they are historically underrepresented communities from you know, the beginning and the founding of this uh, country. And so if, the, if there is a larger proportion of people in communities that are already underrepresented, that don't feel comfortable filling out the census because of that question, because of the general political environment, then what you're, what you're basically doing is you're underrepresenting these populist communities and overrepresenting communities that are more, uh, that, that don't have those minority groups or those uh, folks in them. And that's gonna change the way in which federal dollars flow. It's also gonna potentially change the way in which the lines are drawn. And you'll have districts that technically have people in them, uh, but they're unseen. They're, in, they're invisible in terms of the census. And so, the, basically what is happening now, th there's a couple of different Supreme Court cases. Uh, the Supreme Court's gonna hear arguments on one of the cases uh, coming up in March. But you also have states that are investing in complete count committees. California's investing money in trying to make uh, you know, uh, outreach efforts happen. But we know that grassroots action is what really matters and, and is really important. So at the local level, having volunteers at their local library or having uh, other local complete count committees uh, with folks that are part of these underrepresented communities be able to say this is why the census matters. If you care about Head Start getting funding or if you care about your political representation, it is really important that we fill out the census. And that's, that's the main concern is that the undercount in certain communities is gonna be uh, more than it already normally is. And there's always, in the last, elect the last census, um, I do a lot of census work as well, um, in the last census, there's a gross undercount of women and children. There's a gross undercount of women and children. And, and so there are two particular issues that we're bumping up against this election, I mean, this census, um, that the administration has actually cut funding um, for the census. We don't see the level of funding. Um, and so there's a real concern where there will be, and, and then the second piece, um, there's a, a, a lot of concern around having access. In many of these communities, if the census um, uh, form is online, you've got broadband issues. I know that's not, an, it may not be an issue here, but particularly in certain states in the South, you've got these urban centers, but the majority of the state is actually rural, and the infrastructure, even in terms of the technology, is not there. So you also, as we move to um, putting everything online and, and asking people to fill that out, there becomes a gap in that. So there's, there's two kind of warring issues around having a concern about gross undercount, particularly in some of these states where you don't have, and in rural communities, that you don't have broadband as access, and then two, in, um, where you don't have adequate funding for outreach. 
Well, thank you. Um, let's give our panelists one more round of applause. And I just want to say thank you to each of you for participating. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think he's coming up.